Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Humanities Forum. My name is Raymond Hain, and I'm a member of the philosophy department here and the director of the forum. One of the things the forum does in trying to provide a regular space for reflection on the humanities is partner with other programs and departments on campus. This week's lecture is held uh, in cooperation with the program for uh, Latin American and Latina Latino studies. In order to introduce our guests, uh, we have the director of that program, Father David O'Reek from the History Department with us today. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to have Relena Adorno back here at Providence College again with us. She is an honorary, uh, is an honorary professor at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Peru, an honorary associate of the Hispanic Society of America, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, appointed in 2009 by President Barack Obama. Um, Ordono serves on the National Council of Humanities, the advisory board of the National Endowment of Humanities. She is the seventh recipient in 2015 of the Modern Language Association's Award of Lifetime as Scholarly of Achievement, which is given once every three years at all modern languages and literatures. She is the only recipient to date. The first award was given in 1996, who specializes in the Spanish language. You'll hear more about that later. In 2016-17, Adorno lectured around the country as the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar. And in 2018, she was honored with the Eugene Anderson Imbert Prize from the North American Academy of Spanish Language which is affiliated with the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language in Spain. 2019, she will occupy the senior chair in countries and cultures of, South, uh, of the South and at the United States Library of Congress, John W. Kluge Center. Her books include Colonial Latin American Literature, a very short introduction, De Cane a Macondo, Studios de Literatura Latinoamericana, the Polemics of Possession in Spanish America, Narrative, and Guama Pomon, Writing and Resistance in Colonial Peru. She is the co-author of Alv Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, His Account, His Life, and Expedition, oh, and the Expedition of Panfilio Nervais, and a co-editor in print and digital editions of Felipe Guama Poma de Ayala, Nueva Cronica y Buen Gobierno. Her books have received awards from the Modern Language Association, the American Historical Association, the Western Historical Association, and the New England Council of Latin American Studies. Her most recent book, co-authored with Roberto Gonzalez Echeverria, is Breve Historia de la Literatura Latinoamericana, Colonial, uh, Colonial y Moderna. Nevertheless, her first and last love is always teaching. She has served on the faculties of Syracuse University, Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and Princeton University. She joined the senior faculty at Yale in 1996. Born and raised on a farm in eastern Ohio, Iowa, Relena Dorno received a BA from the University of Iowa and a PhD from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Please let us welcome Relena Dorno. Is it on? Can you hear? Yes, was that yes? OK, thank you. Thank you very much all for being here. I realize that it is a Friday afternoon, and a particular Friday afternoon, which is before your last week of classes, before the Thanksgiving break. And so uh, I very much appreciate, I know the exams you're probably preparing for and the papers that you're trying to write in the meantime. So I appreciate your being here with me this afternoon. And I want to thank Father David Arik and also Professor Raymond Hain for such a warm welcome to Providence College. It's not the first time I'm here, but uh, when if I'm invited, I, I always come back. So national holidays. 
Bill, let me tell you, we're going to be looking at a number of pictures, but in between times, we're going to have blanks. And the blanks have been put in deliberately so that I hope you will reflect on what I am saying rather than um, daydreaming about the image that would still be projected. It won't be in front of you. National holidays are always controversial, none more so than Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, as observed in my own and many other campuses and municipalities across the United States. And I imagine that you're all familiar with events of a little over a year ago in Charlottesville, Virginia, and New York City about public monuments those that are seen as celebrating slavery in Charlottesville, the statues of Robert E. Lee, and here are two of Robert E. Lee, also uh, Stonewall Jackson, and in New York, the statues of Christopher Columbus, seen, interpreted as celebrating, of course, the conquest and colonization of the New World. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio authorized late last year a survey of symbols of hate around the city. The public monuments to historical events you see have become the latest object of focus and debate regarding how we remember or how we imagine or reimagine the past. In these few minutes, I would like to take you on a brief tour of how national holidays get made, how Columbus Day and more recently and importantly Hispanic Heritage Month came into being and have been observed, including the most recent controversies and why Hispanic Heritage Month matters to us all and nationwide. There are five national holidays that fall under the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which was passed by the United States Congress in the 1960s and 70s. There's President's Day, Memorial Day, Columbus Day, and Veterans Day, which is going to be this coming Monday. And since 1983, as a national holiday, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Columbus Day. We stand today in the aftermath of what was declared in this country in 1934 as a United States federal holiday called Columbus Day. And we also call it unofficially in this country, as in Latin America and in Spain, such things as El Dia de la Raza. And here I should remind us all that the word raza isn't meant in a Darwinian or bigoted sense, but rather refers to the Mexican thinker Jose Vasconcelos, who called the cosmic race that which incorporates peoples of all skin colors and physical characteristics in a broader culture that includes Spanish, native Amerindian, and African and African American traditions. In Spain, the day was also called Fiesta Nacional, as you can see there. In Argentina, El Día del Respeto a la Diversidad Cultural. In Uruguay, El Día de las Américas. In English-speaking Belize, the Day of the Americas. And in the Bahamas, where it all began with Columbus's landfall on the 12th of October, 1492, Discovery Day. A few words, though, about the meaning of Columbus's voyages and the expansion of the world from the European perspective to include the Western Hemisphere. It's hard for us really to comprehend from where we stand today how totally Western consciousness was transformed in the 17th century be on the basis of the things that had happened in the previous generations, the previous generations of the uh, 15th and particularly the 16th centuries. Every fixed point that oriented the world in the 1490s began to wobble from the European perspective. Columbus's initial voyage to America destroyed established geography and remapped the world. You'll recall that until that time, the world was divided into three parts. The fourth part of the world is this hemisphere, the Western hemisphere, all of it on which we are standing. The Protestant Reformation in the early 16th century put an end to the uh, exclusiveness of the Roman Catholic Church, and astronomy also was thought anew. Heliocentrism, the doctrine that the Earth revolves around the sun instead of vice versa, was announced by Copernicus in 1543 and championed by Galileo in the early 1600s. And you know what happened to Galileo. 
It too reoriented the established cosmos. In short, nearly everything that educated Europeans believed about reality turned out to be different than what had been known to be to that point. But we long since have gotten very much used to all of those ideas. In the United States, starting in the late 18th century and continuing right up through the fourth centenary of Columbus's arrival for the first time in the, United, in the Western Hemisphere, that year was 1892, Columbus incarnated the intrepid entrepreneurial spirit of the self-made man, that is, he who did well in the name of doing good. The term, by the way, the self-made man, is an American invention by a senator in the United States Senate. Those incarnations most frequently took the part and have taken the part over the centuries of public art in paintings and history. Here is a trio of them. This is from 1519. And remember, there are no known authentic portraits of Columbus made during his lifetime, looking very serious. Here, here's another one where he looks like a Renaissance gentleman. Um, and this was a likeness that was used in 1893 with the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And here is my personal favorite. This is a woodcut by a German artist, as you can see, uh, looking uh, just a little uh, shifty one way uh, or the other. Now, we're going straight over to uh, New Haven, Connecticut. That's just an hour and a half away on the train. And there are more reasons than one why you should visit New Haven. There are, well, pizza would be one. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you here, this is a statue erected by the Italians, as you see, of New Haven in 1892. And there is the statue. This is in, in Worcester Square, which is the old Italian neighborhood of New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, lots of barbershops and plenty of pizzerias. But why do we suppose that those Columbus statues were erected by Italian-American communities all over the country for the fourth centenary? After all, the United States Census, and remember, we're about to have one again in 2020, and it's ripe with rift with uh, controversy at this very moment. The US Census of 1850 registered only 3,600 individuals of Italian birth in this country. But less than 20 years later, Italian Americans were celebrating annual Columbus festivities in Philadelphia, Boston, St. Louis, Cincinnati, New Orleans, and San Francisco. But not only the Italian Americans, also, and importantly, and in fact, earlier, the Irish Americans. Ethnicity gave Columbus a lobby, as Michel Roth Trujillo has observed. And ethnicity gave Columbus a second and more numerous group of lobbyists, the Irish Americans. I want to make the point that Columbus, the figure of Columbus, has always been used by other peoples in other times and places for other purposes. The Irish Americans, the Knights of Columbus, the worldwide fraternal organization founded in 19, 1881, 1882, in the basement of a local Catholic parish, St. Mary's, again in my town of New Haven, Connecticut. And St. Mary's Parish has been staffed by Dominicans, by the way, since the 1880s. We easily see how Columbus could play a role in a leading role in making citizens of these immigrants. He provided them with a public example of Catholic devotion and civic virtue, and thus a powerful rejoinder to the cliche that allegiance to Rome preempted the Catholic's attachment to the United States. And that was a real bias in the late 19th century. The founder of the Knights of Columbus, um, that is St. Mary's, uh, I, I am fond of saying that leave it to the Dominicans to have found a parish located precisely in the center of Yale's university campus, uh, but it wasn't as old as the university. In any case, Columbus played a leading role in making citizens out of immigrants because he gave them an example of Catholic devotion and civic virtue. The founder of the Knights of Columbus, Father Michael J. McGivney, 
who was declared venerable by Pope Benedict XVI on March 15, 2008, had suggested, as this is the founder, the name for the order, the Sons of Columbus. However, key members of the organizing group were not Italo-American, Sons of Columbus, but rather Irish-born Americans, and indeed, veterans of the Civil War. They felt it would be better, and now we're in the 1880s, to establish the name of the fraternal organization using a noble ritual, that of knighthood, which was not identified exclusively with one ethnicity, that is, those of Italian descent. And this was, in fact, used to support the emerging cause of US civil liberties for Roman Catholics in this country. If you know anything about the foundation of public education in the United States, you know that it was a 19th century phenomenon, and you know that soon after, Catholic parochial schools came into existence precisely, precisely to counteract that Protestant dominant view of American public education. In any case, the order was founded then as the Knights of Columbus in October of 1881. And I encourage you to visit the Museum of the Knights of Columbus in New Haven, where that it's the largest fraternal organization uh, in the world, um, Catholic uh, fraternal organization in the world, to see something about that history. And it's a late 19th century history beginning then. These are some of the displays there. As a matter of fact, you'll remember when um, Santa Teresa, Saint, uh, Saint Teresa, uh, well, uh, Teresa, uh, before she became, when she was sainted, when she was canonized, the official portrait that hung in Rome uh, on that occasion had been painted by an artist from our neck of the woods, from North Carolina, actually, and it was given by then the Knights of Columbus to Rome for that um, splendid occasion. In any case, a decade later, in 1892, and there we see again, 1492, 1892, the Italian-American Roman Catholic community of New Haven erected its statue of Columbus in Worcester Square. You see how important it has been. And when we think about issues of immigration today, we have to think about the history of immigration in this country, certainly through the 19th century, because so many of us come from those ethnic traditions, from immigrants to citizens and proud citizens of the United States. Well, besides pizza, uh, New Haven can uh, sport uh, this particular tribute to the importance of the Italian-American community uh, at that time. This is curious, because in Connecticut, most Italian immigration is not northern Italian. It is rather southern Italian, and in fact, Sicilian, as was my late husband's family. And in homage to the new country where those Italian Americans proudly resided, Columbus became the figure. The Irish American and the Italian American initiatives at the time of the fourth centenary were not, as you have already surmised, coincidental. The passion that they poured into their efforts are muted now. And even more so is the sting they felt in the 19th century of being Roman Catholics, Roman Catholic immigrants in Protestant dominant America. Still, even as late as the presidential election of 1960, the rumors flew. Maybe there are just one or two of you here who might remember that presidential campaign. The rumors flew that because John Fitzgerald Kennedy was of Irish-American descent and a Roman Catholic, he would not make a fit president. After all, so went the political hysteria. If the first ever Catholic were elected to the United States presidency, the Pope would be running America. Looking at all that religious and ethnic bias, we can well understand today 
today's communities of Latino and Latinx cultural political activism and their efforts to move fully into the American mainstream, and at the very least, to give pride and prominence of place in local and regional communities around the country. Since the 1960s, and that was certainly including the fifth Colombian centenary in 1992, the image of Columbus has rather taken that of a Renaissance-era Darth Vader. You know him better than I, the Star Wars protagonist whose fall from grace and turn to the dark side has made him a permanent figure in the public imaginary. The, historic, the historical Columbus's fall from grace really began to take shape earlier in the 1950s and the early 1960s. These were the eras of the civil rights movement in this country and civil rights legislation, the Vietnam War and the protests nationwide that challenged so many presumably fundamental American beliefs and feminism, which was called at the time the women's liberation movement. Yes, it was called that. In the United States University, the 1950s Cold War era inspired area studies programs, African American, Af digo, Latin American studies, African studies, East Asian studies, South Asian studies, and so forth. And that led naturally in the 1970s and afterward to the creation of our ethnic studies programs, African American studies, Latino American studies, Asian American studies, Puerto Rican studies, Chicano studies, depending on the university and part of the country that you were in. But regarding Columbus, oh sorry, we didn't mean to keep you up so long. Regarding Columbus, most important were efforts that had taken place among Native American peoples and their supporters. In fact, Indigenous Peoples Day, so often called Native American Day, all rose as a response to and rejection, rejection of the 1992 quincentenary celebrations. These are just some old posters, and I put them up precisely so that you would see that this has been going on <clears throat> for a long time. But one of the real spurs for this was a United Nations International Conference that occurred in 1977, which had a conference on the discrimination against indigenous populations in the Americas. This took place in Geneva, Switzerland not in the United States. But in July of 1990, the first Continental Conference on 500 Years of Indian Resistance was convened in Quito, in Ecuador, and the attendees from Northern California or later organized protests and convinced the City Council of Berkeley, California to declare October 12th a day of solidarity with indigenous people. And 1992, the year of indigenous peoples. So if you Google indigenous peoples day right now, well, not right now, but later today, you're going to find that there are dozens of state and local alternatives to the national holiday of Columbus Day. But what about the Columbus statues like that in New Haven and all over the country? Given the events, in Charlottesville, Virginia, a little over a year ago, you'll remember the white supremacist uh, demonstration in August of 2017, and the controversies that were subsequently generated on the other side over the statues of Robert, the statue of Robert E. Lee, the movement then spilled over into other public places and monuments. Currently, in Charlottesville, both the Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson statues still stand. As decreed by the Charlottesville City Council, they were shrouded with tarps as a sign of mourning after the violence, after the violence, and you'll recall the death of uh, August 11th and 12th of 2017. But six months later, those tarps were removed by order of a judge of the Charlottesville Circuit Court, and a final ruling on the fate of those statues is still awaited. I asked a friend who lives in Charlottesville 
uh, a few days ago what was happening at the moment, and she said, not much. Everyone here seems to have monument fatigue. At Yale University, the residential college named for John C. Calhoun, who was a benefactor of Yale, and an elected public official, US Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of War, United States Senator, was also a slaveholder. And that residential college was renamed after a series of committees and series of protests for a pioneer in the computer science field, Grace Murray Hopper, who pioneered that and had a career in the Navy, died as a Navy Rear Admiral in 1992, coincidentally. And on the Columbus statue front, the story isn't over either. A year ago, the debate in New York City involved that 76-foot statue of Columbus located at Columbus Circle outside Lincoln Center. And while considered for removal as part of New York City's Symbols of Hate survey, there, it, it still stands to this day. But there are other monuments. There was a plaque in Lower Manhattan to Henri Philippe Pétain, who was considered a Nazi collaborator. It still stands. That is, it still appears. But there was a Central Park statue of Dr. Marion Sims, who operated on enslaved African American women for the purpose of developing advances in gynecological surgery. Only the Sims, that's Marion Sims, a masculine, not feminine Marion. Only the Sims statue was removed, and it was removed to the Brooklyn Cemetery, where that experimenting surgeon is buried. Meanwhile, maybe you've heard about this one. A new Columbus statue has been erected. This is in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, and it is called the Birth of the New World. At 350 feet high, it is the tallest statue in the Western Hemisphere. Surprisingly, it survived last year's Hurricane Maria. Now, here's an interesting story. It was created by a Russian sculptor who presented it as a gift to the United States. But nobody would take it. Several cities explicitly rejected it. New York, Boston, Miami, Cleveland, Fort Lauderdale, and even Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> but it's there in Arecibo. In any case, in the Latin American literary imaginary, Columbus has also had a place. In fact, two fine literary works that I will mention anticipated, anticipated the rethinking of Columbus's experience and its meaning for us today. Two of the greatest novelists of Latin America reimagined Columbus's experience, and they did so by imagining his personal concern for how he would be judged by posterity. And this judgment certainly came to pass. As we have seen, posterity has indeed taken a serious look at the Colombian legacy. First, I would mention uh, Cuban novelist Alejo Carpentier's final novel, thinking no doubt about his own literary legacy, called El Arpa y la Sombra from 1979, translated into English not terribly well, but translated nevertheless as The Harp and the Shadow. And what, what Carpentier does in that novel is Columbus is dealing with the fact that he has all of these writings, and he is supposed to give a final confession, naturally, before his death. And so he shoves the papers, all of his writings, under, the, under his bed, under his deathbed, and then finally understands in the end that he's going to have to face what will be his historical legacy on the basis of his own testimony. And by the way, Father David, it turns out that Las Casas uh, appears in the novel, is also fictionalized, attacking Columbus. And so he's called, oh, here comes that serpent in sandals again, meaning the diabolical and, that, and, the, and the friarly attire at the same time. 
In any case, the Paraguayan novelist Augusto Roabastos wrote his Vigilia del Almirante. That was about a decade later in the late 80s, and this could be translated as the Admiral's Vigil. To my knowledge, it hasn't been translated into English. But not unlike these recent events about the removal of public monuments, both of these novels conveyed two important ideas. It's the same for ourselves and our country now. It is impossible to escape history. It is impossible to control history retrospectively. We cannot escape our own or our country's histories, and we cannot control or change them retrospectively. So here's the problem. How do we deal with them? Hispanic Heritage Month. Of greater interest and importance than Columbus Day is Hispanic Heritage Month. This goes back to 1968, when President Lyndon Baines Johnson declared a Hispanic Heritage Week in 1968. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan expanded the commemoration to a full month. And as you know, it begins each year on September 15th, the anniversary of independence of five Latin American countries, uh, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, Mexico, and Chile, and Belize also celebrate their independence during this period, this period of this month. Nationally, in this country, Latinos comprise the largest and fastest growing segment of our population. With the 2010 census, the most recent one, counting them as more than 54 million people strong. I need not add that the Hispanic community is an emerging and, in fact, well-established economic, cultural, and political force in this country if you look at election results of just two days ago around the country. Now, the U.S. Census of 2010 showed that the Hispanic population increased by more than 15 million people in those 10 years between the census of 2000 and 2010, which meant that it accounted for more than half, more than half of the nation's increase in total population during that period. And you will have heard there are many figures and estimates by 2050, the Hispanic population of the United States is projected to be more than 133 million people strong. In the Midwest, where we are not now, Latinos represent the largest minority group, accounting for about 7% of the population. And in this context, I want to call your attention to the Latino Americans Film Project, one of the major sponsors of which, I'm proud to say, was the National Endowment for the Humanities, on whose National Council I serve. The Latino Americans is the first major documentary series to chronicle the rich and varied history and experiences of Latinos who have helped to shape this country over the last 500 plus years. The six episodes of Latino Americans were broadcast on public television in 2013, but the series is more accessible, more valuable, and in my opinion, much more important today than ever it was. I think I put a link there. You can watch the Latino Americans videos on demand and stream full episodes online. You can also purchase the DVD, but I'm not selling the thing. I think it should be actually in your Providence College Library, and if we don't have it, I shall help you uh, get a copy of that. Um, this documentary series is accompanied, and here you see it, by a companion volume, uh, which is authored by Ray Suarez, who was a former senior correspondent for National uh, the PBS and it's entitled Latino Americans. It's published by Penguin, 2013 also, the 500-year legacy that shaped a nation. And if you think 500 years is an exaggeration, you're wrong. 
because the series relies on historical documents and for the contemporary periods on personal experience that tell the story of early Latino settlement. I'm talking about the role of Tejanos and Californianos, Californios in American expansion and the role of race in the relationship between the United States and Spanish-held territories. Remember also that Mexico lost about half of its territory, which constitutes roughly half of the western half of the continental United States, in the United States War with Mexico of 1846 to 48. Mexico lost nearly half of its national territory. It's a little difficult for you to see there, but let me chart the states. The million plus square miles that the United States gained as a result of its victory comprises the states of California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah, as well as parts of Wyoming, Colorado, and Oklahoma. I want to pause on the Latin American series because it tells the story of the role of Latinos in our wars. You're not even thinking about the United States Civil War, but more than 20,000 Hispanics fought in that war, for starters, through World War II and, of course, well beyond. The series, The Latino Americans, considers the complex history of immigration, tradition, its reinventions, the creation of new American identities based on the influx of people from Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and all the other countries of Central and South America, as well as Spain. The Latino American series, and I would have said, concludes with the contemporary consideration of immigration, both legal and illegal, that the debates surrounding it from 1980 are charted up into the present, but alas, only until 2013. And I think you're probably all aware from some of the very important courses that you're taking in various fields about the importance of these immigration debates today. The Latino uh, experience documents in the Latino Americans the enormous, ebullient Latino influence in music, sports, the media, politics, and entertainment. I want to show you Rita Moreno. This is 1961. She's an octogenarian now, but here she is winning the Oscar for the supporting role in Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story. She has been asked about a million times, isn't she disappointed that she played the supporting role of Anita and not the starring role of Maria, which was given to the Russian-American actress Natalie Wood? And Rita Moreno has always replied, no, not at all. I'm the one who got the Oscar. <laughs> and I want to show you the, the time. I saw her in the film, of course, then, but this is... Uh, I saw her in person on this great occasion. This is when, this is the East Room of the White House of the United States, and you recognize President Obama awarding her a National Medal of the Arts in 2010. Now, I have to tell you about this ceremony because I'm not sure that it shows on the video of it, but being there, I can tell you. Normally, when someone is awarded a National Medal, there's a uniformed officer of the United States Marines who stands slightly back and to the forward in front at the podium is the President of the United States. And so when someone is honored, as if you were, you would be walking around here, you would politely be stepping up two steps onto the podium to greet the President not Rita Moreno. She's over 80 years old. The moment the word Rita is out of the Marine's mouth, she leaps up onto the podium and, as you see, grabs the President of the United States, which isn't, you know, the sort of thing you do every day. And you see his utter delight, and you can only imagine hers. Rita Moreno lost her husband shortly after that, but she continues. Uh, 
to be uh, an activist for causes that are supportive of Latinos and women. And here is another familiar face, more familiar to you, I'm sure. This is Associate Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor from the Bronx. She graduated from Yale Law School in 1980, and she was a judge on the US Second Circuit Court of Appeals. She was appointed by President Obama to the Supreme Court in 2009 obviously its first Latina Supreme Court justice. But she didn't leap onto any stage because as you know, she sits on a bench. And finally, the Latino Americans Project can't be highlighted without bringing to you another equally important one, equally created by the National Endowment for the Humanities. This one isn't as long in history, created equal. America's civil rights struggle, struggle traces African American history in the United States from the 1830s to the 1960s. The first episode, The Abolitionists, is obviously dramatized because this is a 19th century phenomenon, but slavery by another name, freedom writers, and the loving story are all actually done on the basis of interviews and so forth. The loving story is actually the name uh, of, of, uh, of a couple, uh, an interracial couple that found out that they were uh, illegally married uh, in their state of, um, let me not get it wrong so I won't state it. You can Google that later too, the loving story, the loving couple. They were supported uh, pro bono by two young lawyers before the Supreme Court of the United States and they won their suit to be legally married. Those pro bono lawyers are now a lot older than you are and certainly in the film they look about your age. But when they stood up that evening in the public portion of the Supreme Court of the United States, it was just as moving to see them as it was to see Associate Justice Stephen Breyer, who hosted that event, Created Equal, America's Civil Rights Struggle. Now, the living Hispanic heritage at the local level goes back certainly to the spirit of President Lyndon Johnson when he gave that 1968 proclamation of Hispanic Heritage Week. And what's of interest to us here, all of us who are in school or are uh, teachers and professors, is the fact that in 1927, I know that seems like the Middle Ages, actually it isn't, he entered Southwest Texas State Teachers College, it's now Texas State University at San Marcos, and he majored there in history and social sciences. He received his BA, and around the same time he earned his normal school, ele elementary school teaching certificate, and for a year he served as principal and teacher at the Wellhausen, this was a public school in a tiny town, Cotula, in southeastern Texas. And if you look closely at this photograph, you see him in the middle with his hair parted in the middle. His work there with destitute Hispanic students had an important effect, I believe, on his attitude toward poverty, the importance of education, and the role of government in relation thereto. And I want you to remember this photo because I'm going to show you a, a more recent one um, in just a few minutes. Returning or remaining at the theme of the Latinos at the local and regional level, I want to return your attention now because we often think of the Hispanic Latino population as being primarily urban, but remember that it is also significantly rural, significantly part of small town America too. This is a perspective less well known nationally, but it has been key to the revitalization of rural communities and towns across the Midwest and the whole agricultural food product pr processing industry. And for me, it's partly a personal story. The first Spanish language speakers I ever encountered were Mexican migrant workers who followed the hand harvested crops from the southern United States 
through the Midwest all the way to the Pacific Northwest. They passed through the Middle West, including the uh, Eastern Iowa, which in addition to being a major area of production of corn and livestock, also produces tomatoes, Heinz ketchup. The H.J. Heinz Company, which is based, as you know, or used to know when you could read the bottles before, but they changed the design, is based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But it ha now has about 76 different manufacturing facilities around the world. Its oldest facility outside of Pittsburgh was Muscatine, Iowa. It's a smallish city on the Mississippi River. That plant opened in 1892, and to this day, nearly 10% of Heinz ketchup production comes from Muscatine, Iowa. Each year, the Mus Muscatine plant produces about 20 million cases of products, and workers there fill 70 to 80 truckloads of Heinz products every day. You may not care about, care about ketchup, but you, if you care about the Latino heritage and experience in this country, ketchup is a very good place to begin because tomatoes are a hand-harvested crop. And it was in the 1950s, the period of the Bracero Agreement between Mexico and the United States. That was the program by which temporary contract laborers were admitted from Mexico to the US as guest workers. In the 1950s, which was the decade of my childhood, those migrant workers lived in substandard outbuildings on local farms. And local merchants, like my great uncle Ernst F. Peterson in his general store in Sunbury, Iowa, population 50 persons, stocked not only canned goods manufactured by the names we all know, but also old El Paso. Now I want to give you a poignant example from my own local community at the time. This is my niece's kindergarten class. The town is Durant, Iowa. It's public school. It's the kindergartners of 1960 and 61. It's two halves, you see. The top half are those children who came from the country and the rural community, and the town children are those who went to school in the afternoon. I want you to look closely at this. These were the children. That's my niece, second row down to the left, were bussed in from surrounding farms and the countryside. Now, if you look and you count, you will see there a group of 38 rural students and find the 17 Latino children. Their surnames are duly penned in. You see the teacher, Verda Cole, there, a lovely person she was, she has put in the names of each one of those little children. See if you can find the three Sandovales, the two little Garcias, the little Miss Sainz, and the little Miss Rada. I've always regarded Mrs. Cole as the most kind-hearted soul, and it would be fascinating now, but it's much too late to query her about her reminiscences. The issue is education. You see, after the local harvesting was done, those children, those seven children, would be gone from the school as their parents migrated northward to harvest the crops. What I find heroic and remarkable here, against all odds for stability and permanence in those days, is that those parents enrolled their children in local public schools no matter the length of time they would be in residence. Mexican and Central American, this is what she prepared for the students. This is what my niece actually gave me when I told her what, about this talk. She said, well, I have something you might be interested in. And as you see, it really is. There we are. It is the case, and here I gave you that quote from Johnson's proclamation of 1968. We believe, that is you and I, that education is not an expense, 
It is an investment. And he's talking about the role of the federal government. But you must see that this is also the attitude of those parents, the Radas, the Sciences, the Garcias, the Sandovales, who sent those small children to kindergarten for however many months they would be there. The United States and Mexico Bracero movement has a very checkered history. I'm not going to go into it now because it's yet another thing that you can Google on another occasion. Its ups and downs included in the 1950s and 1954 a program called Operation Wetback, and you can imagine what that was about. Uh, but if you can't, you can look it up or ask me about it later. Nevertheless, after that sad moment, the number of Bracero workers from Mexico increased until it was about 440,000 in 1959. And this is the period of my memory and of my niece's acquaintance with Latino children in our small town schools. If you'd like a fairly recent overview of this period in the national perspective, see this University of California imprint titled Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies. Migrant Workers in the United States. Seth Holmes is the author. But what I want you to note particularly is the field worker that you see there is a child. But let's go back to catch up and other agricultural project, pro, pro, process products. Ketchup, Muscatine, Iowa. Green Giant, Glenclo, Minnesota. Cargill Meatpacking, Beardstown, Illinois. Tyson Meat Products, Waterloo, Iowa. Lewis Rich Turkey Products, now West Liberty Foods, West Liberty, Iowa. There's a problem here, and this is the one that I want you to think about. The problem is there are many small towns now that are majority Latino in population. One of those tiny towns is West Liberty, Iowa, as a matter of fact. And I remember going there uh, with my husband to Mass in 1980, and we were looked at with extreme suspicion by all of the parishioners, all of whom were permanent members of the community who were Latino. And why were they looking at us so curiously? The priest was officiating in Spanish, it was an Anglo priest officiating Spanish. But they naturally thought that we were from what is now called ICE, the Immigration and Custom Service. We assured them afterward that we weren't, they were quite puzzled that we could speak Spanish, and that was the lingua franca that allowed us to establish at least a social contact with them. So what is happening, and you know it in this part of the country too, there are many programs of bilingual education, and these are, some of them are supported by Spain's Ministry of Cooperation, uh, between Spain and the United States and have specific and good training programs. But I met a few people, young people like you, or just a couple of years older, who have taught in those programs and in those small towns. And they say there are many pedagogical issues that need to be considered, but the social issue is even the bigger one. And that's the difference we're going to think now of two terms. One is cultural diversity, and the other one is biculturalism. And they may come up a little differently than you think. The, bi, the cultural diversity model would project and imagine a community that is entirely or mostly diverse, but also integrated while the bicultural community would literally be two societies living side by side where tensions naturally arise. This is the case in so many, in so many areas. And it's particularly critical in the small and rural, small town and rural areas, because there you see 
nobody can just blend in to the crowd as part of a large urban population. This, to me, is the real outstanding problem as we go forward. You're the young people. You're the ones with the future. You're the ones who will especially be wanting to think about these issues as time goes on. So we wonder about those Latino populations at the local level. These little children would now be adults. In fact, they would be nearing retirement. They would be having children of their own. They are demographically numerous and growing, economically productive, and socially, that's the question. Biculturalism or integrated cultural diversity. So I wonder, and I'd like you to think too about what happened to those two little Garcia boys, the three Sandovales, and the little girls named Rada and Sainz. They've grown up, they've produced their families, probably. They have had the greater part of their futures. But what happened to them, what happened to these particular people? This is 1960-61, the Bracero movement ended in 1964. I can't answer those questions, and I think none of us can at this moment. But the question that we all need to, I hope, keep in mind has to do not so much with aspirations, certainly not with proscriptions, but rather with the reality, the reality of today's American society. And we can thank two United States presidents, one, Lyndon Baines Johnson, a Democrat, and the other, Ronald Reagan, a Republican, for taking executive action to celebrate this country's 500-year Hispanic heritage. It hasn't escaped me, and I'm sure not you, that LBJ was from Texas, and though born in Illinois, Reagan was a Californian. But in their respective moments, they were prescient about the Hispanic presence in this country just as the two Latin American novelists I mentioned, Alejo Carpentier and Augusto Roabastos, were about the Colombian legacy. <clears throat> I'm choked up. You can finish with my sentence in all of the Americas. Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes or so for discussion. If you would wait and let me bring you the micro, mi <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> would you like I need some, some water, water too. <laughs> uh, wait and let me bring the microphone to you just so we can record your question. And if possible, we'd like to begin with a question from a student. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation. My question for you would be, where do you see the Latinx identity going like, in the future? I see it going forward, and I see it going forward with, uh, with, with more courage, more openness. You know, my idea of social progress or regress, this is social progress. You can't put toothpaste back into a tube very easily. So while the struggles are going to be there, I am sure, in all like-related issues, I see it only as going forward and in many positive ways, despite the bumps along the road. I don't think anything is possible to turn the, you can't, you can't turn the clock back completely, and you can't erase what is already out there, as we learn from those public statues. Yes. Hi, um, thank you for coming out today. I just wanted to know why do you think the Latino history often gets forgotten in the um, American public school system today? Well, yes, thank you. I, that's also an important, both of those are very important questions. Uh, what happened to my, oh, sound equipment here. Uh, there it is. Um, we have been uh, in this country in, in public education and I, I know something about that from many years ago, 
the only way we took in the Latino heritage in this country in public school teaching was to do, and this is like at the junior high school level, the conquest of the the conquest of Mexico by the Spanish and the conquest of Peru by the Spanish. And that was it. And what do you have there? You have nothing except a triumphalist white European history coming forth. Um, that's just an example. But I also think that we have in this country assimilated the black legend of Spanish history. And that means it's almost a given that this country is white, European, uh, mostly Protestant, but not uh, altogether any longer. And it's just been an enormous blind spot. I was recently in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida on Tampa Bay, where there you could imagine there's every reason to foreground the history, uh, the Spanish history of that era, of that, of that area because it really starts in the early 16th century. It starts in the 1520s. And yet, and yet, there's almost no one, it was at a big public symposium, who even realized that Spanish speakers were there long before the British and their heirs were. So it's been, you know, it's, uh, it, it's been omitted, which means I guess you could say it's also been erased. It just hasn't been brought forward. And I think all of our work today has to do your work, too, not just mine. I'm just a you know, university professor. has to do with bringing out those perspectives. I still am really hopeful about the Latino Americans Project. I think that was absolutely phenomenal. And even 10 years earlier, that wouldn't have been done. And it is a marvelous resource. And it's all about awareness. The more aware we are of things, the more we're able to deal with them uh, intelligently. And we can tell our friends, right? Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question. It sort of gets to um, the name of that group, La Raza, which of course La Raza, yeah, yeah means race. Um, and you gave an argument why it might be understood not purely in racial categories, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but of course the word still is the same. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sort of wondering the future when when I hear presentations like 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 this, which is a fine one, and I enjoyed it. Um, the Emphasis often is on demography, like um, our group is growing. It's getting larger and larger. It might even outstrip your group. And, and I'm wondering if that is a recipe for a healthy future for a country. Um, because it's not a surprise. I mean, we're becoming more of a tribalized society where we begin to Certainly. define each other. Uh, by uh, you're white, I'm this, I'm that. And after a while, um, if nothing binds us other than our own identity group, we're going to be fighting with one another. And dem demography is not going to settle that because no. the, that's just not history. History is not ultimately demography. There's all sorts of been minorities that have dominated majorities. So I'm just kind of curious because every time I hear the word La Raza, I, I think, wow, is that really the way... Um, uh, you want to go on that because, um, yeah, racial tribalism is, it's been tried before. It's a pretty bad idea. Um, I'm just curious what yeah, your reaction yeah. would be. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. La Raza in this context does go back to an, a Mexican philosopher, and it includes all the traditions, that is, the Native American, the African, the African and ultimately African American and European Spanish heritage as well. So it's a very particular use. It isn't used, now you'll see, you'll notice those examples from Indigenous Peoples Day, which is a slightly different thing. So I think the fearsomeness of the word la raza is something that uh, is, uh, is likely to change over time. You know, when something becomes stigmatized, really stigmatized, then 
we don't use it. We look for another term or another euphemism or whatever. But uh, the, uh, I also think that the, uh, I don't speak of it that way. I'm giving you the examples of what's out there. And indeed, this is done in, uh, in different uh, Latin American countries too. I find it less prevalent here, unless the experience of all of you is different. But uh, Indigenous Peoples Day seems to be carrying, and of course, Indigenous peoples it can also mean people who were brought here 500 years ago, who become indigenous over half a millennia of time. So I think it's a choice of terms, whatever one chooses. But you've certainly made the point that, yes, it is, it's fearsome to be thinking about the, demo, the demographic growth of any particular group. And, the Hispanic Latino one is certainly growing. And that is going to be a continuing fact. Does it make people fearful? Well, that's in the eye of the hearer and the beholder, I guess. What is going to be productive dialogue? I think that it cannot be really settled uh, at, uh, at any level except in the local communities, not by legislation, not by occasions like this even, which are only for awareness, but the real work that has to be done by real people living in places and rubbing shoulders. Do I have a lot of hope for that? Not right now. So I have a question about Columbus um, yes. and the demonization of Columbus. Um, so going back to your talk, I think the historical perspective is so interesting. So if I understood this correctly, the idea of Columbus Day, I, you know, in falling in October, I, the significance of that, that came from the Italian immigrant population and, and why October, I mean, what is the significance of that? And then I th think it's interesting to note that we we demonize him, yet if it, if the origin of all of this is kind of the immigrant experience, maybe we should rethink that. Um, and I think you know, s looking at Columbus's letters and his journal and all of that um, is really informative. I mean, it really paints a different picture of Columbus. And I just think, for me, I have no problem demonizing Cortez or something. But I mean, I don't know, Columbus. Do you think he's he should be perceived in that way, and wh why have we latched on to him? Maybe just because it's the Columbus Day, but it seems kind of, yeah, and it, it doesn't. It goes against history, really. Yeah, it was. Remember, it was both the Italian Americans and the Irish Americans who brought Com Columbus into dialogue, and there were national, uh, regional, city, municipal celebrations all around. And I think it just took a while to turn it into. Uh, a national holiday, and the day they chose was the landfall. Never mind, it was in the Julian calendar, not the Gregorian calendar. Um, but those, uh, those things uh, came about as out of these immigrant experiences, in, in immigrant aspirations, and now they're quite different. And I was thinking about that, so I'm not thinking I'm answering your question. Uh, Reading Columbus, reading Columbus's own writings uh, is very interesting because it's somebody like all of us, like all of us in our own lives who cannot quite imagine the consequences or anticipate the consequences of the things that we do. None of us can. And I think that with the, one of the best Reflections on Columbus's history is from Fray Bartolomé de las Casas when he wrote of Columbus's experience, but not to make it triumphalist, but to paint the picture of somebody who couldn't possibly have known what the outcomes would be, which is something we can uh, resonate with ourselves. Uh, Columbus has been carried, as the figure has been carried forward. I think he's had his day. I think the new day is La Virgen de Guadalupe.
And that, I mean, she is celebrated in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And certainly, um, La Virgen de Guadalupe, uh, Diego, uh, Juan Diego, who was the Indian who with the Telma who exposed, showed the picture, was canonized in 2002. And uh, Columbus will never be canonized. And, and so I think what happens with the sweep of time is the uh, identification of alternate forms, but they are again of identity and celebration. And, they would, and I would say, to refer back to your question, that yes, La Virgen de Guadalupe would be very, very much not a, um, uh, a hemispheric uh, image as Columbus has been, but certainly one that is Latino and certainly Latin American. But I think uh, she's on her way uh, uh, to, to assume that kind of role. I, uh, I have a quick question for you about, um, I guess, like reflecting on Columbus and his demonization uh, with also recognizing the evangelization that he brought to the Americas. Mm -hmm. um, I believe he brought the Dominican order with him to the Americas as well. Um, and uh, I think it's hard to look back with 100, you know, something that happened hundreds of years ago with 2018-year-old eyes. Uh, yeah. And to really see, like, how the methodology that he used maybe was necessary in some ways, not always. Of course, a lot of the things he did maybe were not always right. Um, but how do you, I guess, see the evangelization that took place um, with, with our eyes and try to encompass, I guess, that whole situation? That's pretty interesting. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, um, the first, the, the evangelization project, Father David is here to correct me, but I'm going to say that the, 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 the major kickoff point was in Mexico uh, in um, 15, uh, tw uh, the 12 Franciscan friars that arrived in what was the year, was it 1521? And the Franciscan, but this is so interesting. Once we talk about Franciscans and Dominicans, we have a very interesting story to tell, and I only know parts of it. Don't sigh. Uh, it is the case that the Franciscans arrived with the notion that a mass evangelization was going to be very possible, mass baptism was going to be possible, and that it would, in fact, lead the way to conversion, conversion being understood as the experience that changes you from the inside out to finally the way, you, the customs and so forth that you have. The Dominicans then said, wait a minute. Something is missing here. People who have reached the age of reason need to be instructed in the ways to become a Christian. It can't be merely assumed by mass baptism and hopeful thoughts, the optimism of those early, early Franciscans. And the Dominicans took with them the idea, in fact, a great, great debate was held in, in, in Valladolid in 1550 about that, and that was about the right. Could you make war on people before evangelizing them? Did you have to beat them in order to help them become Christians? And in that debate, the Dominican position was absolutely not. The only road to conversion is one of peace. And then I'm talking about Fray Bartolome de las Casas, who more than once cited this uh, passage from the gospel, and you read it in three of the gospels, in which um, he quotes Jesus as having said, and if they do not receive you, wipe the dust from your feet and leave that place. In other words, it had to be a voluntary, the voluntary perspective. 
how far Columbus, was there a Dominican on, were there Dominicans on those four voyages? They didn't have right until 1510. Okay. Right, right, and that was to Espanola. 18 years later, they're, right. they're the first to denounce the, the conquest. Right. A year later, they denounced it vigorously. Yes, 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 and we know about that, Father Montesinos. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Exploitation by. Mm-hmm. Second voyage. He stays in the, the Caribbean. Father of American anthropology. He's the first anthropologist. Fray Ramon Panay. Ramon Panay. Yeah. De, uh, Jerome Light. Yeah. We have time for probably just one more question. I Before. think that our young man has a follow up, but we do have one more question. Maybe one and a half more questions. I'll let them both in. Just a. Sorry, go ahead. Hey. <laughs> I come from an Italian family where Columbus is like a huge thing and I've like looking back at history I've often thought like oh this doesn't really seem right and you know when I question you know different things that's one of the arguments that's given so it's just interesting to hear your perspective on that so thank you. Yeah. Yes, and here's a gentleman. Before our last question let me just remind you that we have a reception after this afternoon's event please join us in the great room uh, and we can have lots more time to talk about more more of this. Two questions? Okay, let's do two questions. Uh, this might be a, a slightly different attack. You were talking about biculturalism. D do you feel there's no hope for assimilation? For example, uh, right now, Catholics, Irish, Italians, they're all just one big mix. Uh, is there a chance of a similar kind of mix? Uh, that those of us who aren't Hispanic will pick up on more Hispanic things and it, the other side will go the same way and we'll sort of become more homogenous? Yes, well, where is the crystal ball? One thing I can say for sure is the experience of Italian Americans and Irish Americans in the 19th century and the early 20th to a great degree was they came to this country to truly leave the old country, while the um, Hispanic and Latino immigrants will, I believe, always retain their relations with their relatives and the home country. I think this is a huge difference. And I think also that this may be a factor that prevents that uh, integration that we're talking about. I think it will come, but I think it will be a longer time in coming. Thank you so much for coming. And I guess my question is, do you think with the current government there is any hope for the immigrant caravan coming from Honduras and from different parts of Latin America? I thought somebody would ask me that. <laughs> All I can say is, what do you think? I'm no expert. And I'm, I'm just following day by day and, and seeing what's, what's happening. I think the best we can all do is be very, very attentive to it. And when there is a chance uh, to cast a vote uh, uh, and to make our opinions heard, that's, that's the best. I, I, that's all I'm going to say. I mean, yeah, we all are thinking something different about this, or maybe a lot of us are thinking the same thing. But um, thank you. That really is a question to end the afternoon on. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.